Well, something that was uh, great for me as a commander of this flight was not only did we launch on time, we launched two days earlier than the initial scheduled date when I was assigned as the, the mission commander. Uh, it started here at uh, about midnight as we walked out of the crew quarters and manned up the Astro van. And uh, a few hours later, the main engines lit to take us on up into orbit. You feel that rumble of the engines when they light outside, but you're not really sure till the SRBs light. Then there's a tremendous bright light reflecting off of the launch platform. And it looks like somebody's welding right outside your window. And then you feel the, the kick in, in your back, and you know you're off. And uh, as you can see, we go through the clouds here at about 3,000 feet. Uh, I guess folks are a little concerned with weather, but uh, pretty soon we're VFR on top, and uh, we're off on our way to space. Uh, SRBs are uh, kind of a bumpy ride, uh, you're getting shook around. Uh, it was interesting around Mach 3, it smoothed out, and then shortly thereafter, the SRB sept, and uh, folks on the ground uh, at night got this beautiful view of the two SRBs as they tailed off and sept from the orbiter and looked kind of like a point of light, like a star going off into, uh, into orbit. Now, once we got to orbit, uh, the real work of the mission started uh, opening the payload bay doors and getting about the business of uh, turning our rocket ship into an on-orbit uh, spaceship, we had to uh, convert uh, the mid-deck to a working area, set up the tools and the uh, spacesuits in preparation for the spacewalks upcoming. Prior to the rendezvous, uh, as is normally done on flights like this, we check out the robot arm. The robot arm was a tremendously enjoyable piece of gear to operate, and uh, in our case, it, it checked out fully, completely, as it always does. It's a very reliable piece of gear. None of our simulators can fully prepare you for everything you're going to see during a rendezvous. Number one, the beauty of the real satellite as compared to our visuals, but also uh, the sun uh, in the real world and the confusion you can get on the flight deck just from the number of people who are up there helping out with the task. <laughs> <laughs> it really is a team effort with everybody uh, providing an input. Uh, but we managed to stabilize the telescope uh, like this in the COAS and bring it down so Steve could grab it. Uh, Scotty and uh, Sox were responsible for the first 330 miles or so, and my job was the last 10 feet. Um, they did such a good job with their part that my job was easy. We were able to grab it, and uh, uh, for Sox and me, it was, it was enjoyable to get to see it again and uh, got it berthed on the FSS so that the real mission uh, operations could begin with the EVAs. All right, here we are. Uh, this is a couple days into the flight. We need to check out the EMUs uh, first. As you know, these uh, EMUs were uh, updated. That's a new configuration that we hope to have on station. Once they're all checked out, it's time to don uh, the suits for uh, the first of the EVAs. I've got my uh, Green Bay Packers hat on here, which I wore every day, and I'm sure that was uh, one of the forces that kept us you know, on target <laughs> the, the whole time. Uh, uh, this is coming out of the hatch the very first day. It seems like I'm having a little trouble. I can't figure out why, but we had a lot of, you have a lot of cords and the umbilicals, and you also have tools in the airlock, and a lot of times it's, it's hard to, to kind of get out the door. But once we get out, you can go ahead and start setting up for the day. Uh, the manipulator foot restraint handle was detached, and uh, it was developed here at the Johnson Space Center. Real good job on that. We went up and uh, hooked it on to the MFR and went to work. The uh, first day, the first of the five EVAs was uh, spent removing two large refrigerator-sized objects from uh, the, the telescope. Here I am pulling out the uh, FOS instrument. These instruments weighed between 685 and 850 pounds. Uh, after we pull out one of the old instruments, we then go get one of the new ones out of the payload bay, and this is STIS coming out. Of course, these um, boxes are designed to increase the scientific returns that Hubble will have. We um, are putting uh, STIS into the telescope here. Unfortunately, it happened at night. The major three boxes that we installed all occurred at night, so it made it a little bit more difficult task, and that just is a matter of timing. Uh, after you put a new box into the telescope, you stole the old box, and this is stowing the uh, GHRS box. Uh, I might add that these scenes are all uh, sped up some, to some extent, about five times the normal speed. Everything goes a lot slower in space. Uh, this is just another view of stowing um, GHRS into the payload bay. You might notice over my left shoulder there's a, a gold-colored box. That's a new camera we had on board that actually brought the ground into uh, the work envelope, basically, and looked over our shoulder. And you'll see pictures of that in the upcoming scenes. The uh, EVA took about seven hours that first day. Often we had a chance to look out at beautiful sights. Notice the external airlock here also. That was the first flight of the external airlock. A gorgeous view. 
Well, after uh, Mark and Steve had shown us how to correctly perform EVA, it was uh, Greg and my turn on, on day two. And you put your pants on uh, a little different in space. You can put both legs in at the same time. And suit up was uh, assisted by Doc uh, every time. And here's Greg uh, reporting that he was ready to go. Our job was to change one of the fine guidance sensors. And here uh, we are. Um, working on the doors to that bay. And here is the insertion, also done at night, as Steve noted, of the, uh, the new fine guidance sensor. This box weighs about 500 pounds, but in space uh, doesn't feel like anything. Uh, here we are uh, stowing the uh, old FGS to return it to home, where it will be refurbished and launched on a future mission. We also changed out uh, one of the uh, science tape recorders, and that's the black box that I'm holding right there. And this is a beautiful shot of the Earth reflecting off the telescope. And uh, you can see Greg uh, behind me to, uh, to my left. Uh, once we got done with all the large boxes, the lower 12 feet or so has all of the you know, scientific instruments, we started going in the bays. And there's about uh, 15, 20 different bays that have the electronics that run the Hubble Space Telescope. In this case, I'm changing out a data interface unit. And the DIU had lost half of it, essentially half of its capability, so we put a new one in. Uh, it's a little bit tougher task uh, than some of the normal EVA because it wasn't designed to be EVA uh, compatible. Uh, Electro connectors uh, didn't have wing tabs, a lot of the other things that we tend to do, uh, like the reaction wheel that you see here. The reaction wheel uh, was one of those 12, 15 years ago when they first built Hubble. Uh, that was uh, meant to be changed out EVA. And when we weren't doing the work, the people inside were looking down. This is thunderstorms over the top of Houston. And it's certainly, it's like a string of firecrackers. Uh, it's probably the most incredible lightning display that, um, most, that any of us had ever seen from orbit. So it was pretty spectacular. And you were on the other end of that. So. <laughs> <laughs> I guess here we are uh, getting uh, to work on uh, EVA-4. This is the Solar Array Drive Electronics Box uh, change out. That's uh, Joe handing it off to me and then closing the lid. And I'm on the, uh, on the end of the arm there. And I've got it uh, in my hands. And we go up to go to the work site. Uh, I believe this is at sunrise. So you'll see the uh, lighting change fairly <laughs> rapidly here. And this is uh, real time. <clears throat> Sun uh, goes up and goes down very quickly on orbit. A uh, real uh, commendation to the folks who trained us. This task was just like it was uh, in the training process, uh, except the uh, screws were, they, although they were equally small, they weren't nearly as corroded as they were in the water. But it was, uh, it was a challenging uh, task to change out that solar ray drive electronics box, but it was very doable the way uh, it was designed by the engineers. And there are Joe and I up at the top of the telescope. Uh, we're not paying any attention to the Earth up there, uh, changing out uh, or putting some covers on magnetometers. One of the efforts that was underway while we were out there uh, was Scott was working on some other repairs, some patches that were uh, designed and, and uh, built up by Scott uh, in the course of that EVA day. Uh, I had, uh, Joe and I actually put a couple patches on towards the end of EVA day four, but then Mark and Steve put on the remainder of the patches on an unscheduled EVA day five. Uh, that all uh, went absolutely superbly. Uh, the design developed by the folks on the ground with the stuff available to us was, uh, was just great. Real uh, kudos to everybody that was involved in that. Uh, towards the end of uh, that activity, then we, were, we finished up, and it was the end of the EVAs. With the EVAs successfully completed, it was time to uh let Hubble fly free again. And it's a little bit, I guess, like having your kids come home from college. You know, we were really happy to see Hubble when it showed up. And when it was time to send it off, we were really happy to see it go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, once again, I got to grapple it and uh, uh, raise it up off of the FSS, bring it forward in the bay, uh, release it from the arm. And then I uh, told Scott uh, to go ahead and execute the maneuver, which he did. Um, the maneuver was kicked off by uh, firing the forward jets, and as, and as soon as we did that, uh, we fired the jets. The orbiter went back, and the telescope flew right over the top window. This is a view uh, right over our heads, uh, looking out the uh, starboard window. And uh, it was pretty amazing to see this large telescope fly right over our heads. Uh, the maneuver, 
after uh, the telescope went out of the window, took us so it, we like flew like a loop over and atop the uh, telescope. So the next thing we saw about 15 minutes later was the telescope uh, flying over uh, Sharks Bay, Australia. We saw a lot of Sharks Bay. Um, never got tired of it. Never got tired. It was a beautiful sight. And then we got to see the telescope, almost like a telescope riser, set as it goes across the horizon with the beautiful blue uh, planet in the background. It was quite an amazing sight. Of course, our, uh, our calling theme the whole time was more power to the telescope, and here we are celebrating the fact that telescope has more power. Um, Sox was in real trouble because Valentine's Day had come and gone and he hadn't written home yet. <laughs> so he's, he's catching up, and this is a demonstration <laughs> of one of the uh, real problems with using power tools on orbit. <laughs> and uh, this is a study in hydrofluid mechanics. But it's uh, interesting to note that the uh, little M&Ms will float right in the middle of the water ball. It makes kind of a pretty picture to show your kids. <laughs> Exercise is an important part of daily life on orbit, just as it is on Earth. But uh, we have a little bit better view. And if you find a, a scene that you want to take a picture of, you ask for a camera that on Earth weighs uh, quite a bit, and someone just passes it over to you. Sox's uh, motto was, a, a clean ship is a happy ship. And he got us all <laughs> busy cleaning up. And, we were real fortunate to get some excellent views of the Hale-Bopp uh, comet that is still visible in the morning sky right now. Our uh, first landing opportunity was waved off due to uh, bad weather at the Cape, and so, but we didn't mind. We got this extra view of uh, Florida flying over. You can see Orlando and uh, the Cape and Miami. This is what it looks like inside during a night entry. Uh, you get flashes from the plasma in the overhead windows that, that light up the inside of the ship, and you can see the orange glow. Uh, from the fireball. That's what the orange glow looks like from the outside. Um, and that's uh, pretty much the view the folks here in Houston saw as we streaked overhead at a couple hundred thousand feet. It was great for me. I looked out my left window and there was Houston. I could see the street outlines and uh, right at the lower window frame was where the Johnson Space Center should be. This was the first flight at the Kennedy Space Center where we had centerline lights on the runway. Uh, it was a really nice addition to the runway. Uh, it gave me a good feel during the landing and the rollout for where I was uh, on the runway. Scott did a super job getting the drag chute out, and we uh, tapped the brakes just to check them and make sure they worked. We really didn't need the brakes with the wind that we had that day, but uh, as a pilot, I wanted to see what they felt like. They were beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Jettisoned the, the chute and, and rolled to a stop there on the runway. 103 had been a great place to live and a and a great place to work uh, the whole 10 days we were up in space. And uh, I was kind of sad to see it come to an end. Uh, it's always tough when you, when you end the mission, you know uh, you're not going to be spending as much time with, with your crew as you got to during the, the previous 10 days. <laughs>